The late 90s and early 2000s was an insanely popular time for children's TV, with the skyrocketing ratings of children cartoons such as Powerpuff Girls, Dexter's Laboratory, and many, many others. This was also a time where the world was experimenting once more with the idea of child celebrity. Everywhere you went in the 90s, you saw child stars like Frankie Muniz, the Olsen twins, Mary Kate and Ashley. Yes, they are the older sister of Elizabeth Olsen. And of course, Amanda Bynes, who got her start on two of the most famous children's shows of all time, all That and The Amanda Show, which also launched the careers of many other child actors, including Drake Bell and Josh Peck, stars of later shows like Drake and Josh, or Godfathered, Grandfathered. I never watched the show. You know, you remind me of my stepbrother. Oh, but is he awesome? No, no, he's in jail for stalking Oprah. Look at the mask of my boy. All That, The Amanda Show, Drake and Josh are shows that were created by the now infamous Nickelodeon producer Dan Schneider, who has in recent years come under fire for onset harassment, sexual and verbal assault, and abuse of power. And thanks to the newest HBO documentary, Quiet On Set, all of this came out with members of the Nickelodeon production team sharing the horrendous set environment that has now been brought to light. There is a lot of talk about the alleged abuses that happened and the response from actors and even as of this week, Dan Schneider himself, who chose to sit down for an interview and address the documentary on his own YouTube channel, which, oh boy, we will get into that. But before we do, let me introduce myself. Hello, my name is Rebecca or Ricky. I am an autism advocate and a sexual assault crisis counselor. I talk about all things disability and feminism in media. So if that's something you're interested in, go ahead and be sure to hit those sweet like and subscribe buttons because Apparently a lot of the people who watch my stuff don't subscribe, and to that I just say, why? Just, just click it. Do it. You know you want to. Also, before we get into things, be sure to take a look at my Patreon link or my shop down below. Those things both really help support the channel, and over on Patreon we have all kinds of exclusives such as early access to videos, a members-only podcast, and the ability to go live with me as we record the upcoming content here. Say hi everyone! Well, they're all live! Now, with this video, there are some important things to remember. For legal purposes, much of what we are going to be discussed is all alleged, although some things have been proven in a court of law. There are also going to be some things that we will get into with the documentary that cannot, and I repeat, cannot be a no-nuance discussion. There is a lot of nuance to be had here, and we will get there when we get there. This is also going to be talking about a lot of triggering topics such as sexual assault, sexual harassment, grooming, workplace harassment, and the sexualization of minors. I will be censoring a lot of these topics to please the YouTube gods of the algorithm. And also, please know if you do not think you can handle it and you wind up being triggered a portion of the way through this video, please step away and take care of yourself. There are hotlines you can call that can help you work through your feelings. You do not have to go through this alone. Please do not hesitate to reach out. These hotlines are run by certified crisis counselors like myself who are trained to help you work through this. We are here for you. Much of what will be discussed in this video will be coming from the HBO documentary Quiet On Set, a documentary that highlights the voices of some of the former directors, writers, child actors, and even parents of those child actors who worked with Dan Schneider during his meteoric rise to fame in the 90s and early 2000s. This documentary shared and highlighted the voices of people who were there, who were affected, and I highly recommend you watch it in order to hear the story from them. With all that said, let's take a deep breath and dive into the horrors that is children's TV and the Schneider's Bakery. Dan Schneider didn't start his career off as a producer of famous children's TV shows. In fact, he himself started off in the business as a child actor in performances such as Better Off Dead, The Big Picture, and shows like Head of the Class. Now, would that keep you up nights getting it on with Sarah Lee? <laughs> his skill as a comedic performer led him to catch a lot of attention early on, even leading him to co-host the 1988 Kids' Choice Awards, which introduced him to the head of Nickelodeon programming, where he pitched a brand new idea for a TV show a children's sketch comedy show in the style of Saturday Night Live. Get ready, get set, it's all that. This show became wildly successful and started the careers of Amanda Bynes, Nick Cannon, Kel Mitchell, and even the now longest running Saturday Night Live cast member, Kenan Thompson. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> 
And like Saturday Night Live before it, it even spawned movies based off of sketches from the show, including Good Burger and Good Burger 2. Welcome to Good Burger, home of the Good Burger. Can I take your order? With the series lasting six seasons, it put Dan Schneider into the spotlight as a showrunner and the creator for children's television, giving him the freedom to start other shows using some of the child stars he was helping to create. He went on to create and produce shows such as The Amanda Show, Drake and Josh, iCarly, Zoe 101, Victorious, Sam and Cat, Henry Danger, and Game Shakers. Basically, if you were a kid in the early 2000s, Dan Schneider probably worked on your favorite show. He even developed his own production company called Schneider's Bakery in 2003 to continue producing and showrunning the media that was shaping our childhoods. Dan Schneider's effect on children's media cannot be understated. It also cannot be understated the effects that he had on others around him on set and within the writer's room, and that effect was not great. We're going to be going through the things that were alleged by former co-workers of Dan Schneider from the least problematic to the most problematic, because why not make it fun? And remember, all of these things are alleged for legal purposes. In 1999, the only two female writers on the team for The Amanda Show, Jenny Kilgan and Christy Stratton, were allegedly required to split one salary between the two of them, meaning that for the same amount of work, both women were making likely less than half of what the other writers on the show were. This is actually something that does happen in the industry rather frequently, especially if someone is newer, and these two women were at the time, or at least... That's Dan's excuse. Considering Dan allegedly told both women that he didn't think women were funny or able to write for comedy at all, that to me casts doubt on his story for it. Why did the only two women in the writer's room have to be the ones splitting the salary? They weren't the only people new to the business, so why were they the only two who had to split the salary? In my opinion, and this is just my opinion, it is because he didn't value these women. He can say he never considered gender in hiring, as he did in a statement release, but the experiences of these women and the things that he said tell a different story. Okay, so this one is not alleged as it's something that Dan himself has admitted to happening on set and there are multiple pictures of it. While working in the writer's room or on set or in the editing rooms, he would convince someone, usually female, to give him a shoulder and neck massage. For one, don't touch people in the workplace. Don't touch people in any place. Let's go back to quarantine rules and keep six feet of distance apart from each other. Or if you're a man on Tinder, five foot and eleven inches away from each other. But in all seriousness, asking someone for a massage in the workplace? Already bad. Your boss asking you to give him a massage? Workplace harassment. It is rather telling to me though that out of all of the things that he is accused of here, this is one of the only ones that Dan Schneider admitted to in his response interview. Apologize to the people who were walking around Video Village or wherever they happened because there were lots of people there who witnessed it who also may have felt uncomfortable. So I owe them an apology as well. Sure. They're the real victims here, Dan. Great job. <laughs> Whether people believe the sexual harassment allegations or not, which we'll get to in a bit, one thing that seems to be consistent with reports of people who have worked with Dan Schneider, both male and female, is that Dan either loved you or he hated you. And if he hated you, he made that pretty well known. In an interview with Business Insider, actress Angelique Bates from All That recalled a time in which Schneider screamed at her when she didn't perform well on a sketch, a story that was then corroborated by Bates' mother. Actress Alexa Nichols has repeatedly mentioned a time on the set of Zoe 101 where she was first screamed at by Britney Spears and then reduced to tears by Dan Schneider in an interview about that confrontation the next day. Side note, I cannot imagine how it must have been to be a 13-year-old Alexa getting screamed at by the biggest pop star in the entire world and then by your boss the next day. Also, this is something that Britney Spears herself has since apologized to Alexa for, which Alexa has since accepted. At least one adult in this situation has finally taken accountability. Other instances of a hostile work environment were mentioned by writers that included them getting credit taken away after being fired from the set, something that is illegal, mind you. If someone creates work for a production, they are legally required to be credited for that production. Writer Jenny Kilgan claiming that she was threatened to have her career eliminated if she reported Dan to the Writers Guild for having her and another writer split a salary, a promise that seems to have come true as after her lawsuit against Nickelodeon for gender discrimination and a hostile work environment, she left the entertainment career. 
really sad. Really sad. But then there's also the hostile work environment that the children had to go through, like the filming of On Air Dare. Next Nick, we take a dip in smelly, gloppy dog food. Find out which of these three All That cast members gets Dunkin' Doggy Dinner on this week's Nick On Air Dare. During the filming of On Air Dare, there were a series of dares that the children were required to participate in as a child's version of Fear Factor. Some of these dares included the child being submerged in a pool of worms, being smothered by peanut butter and having it licked off by dogs, having a scorpion be placed in their mouths, and in one particular segment that I remember having watched live as a child, having young actress Chelsea Brummett drink bath water of a trucker. Is this just a camera trick and not actually bath water? Probably. If it was, that's like attempted murder, or at the very least child endangerment. Another particularly bad one that I found while I was editing this video was one in which one of the child actors had to strip down to a diaper and sing the national anthem. I genuinely do not know how we could look at this and think that this was entertainment. It's very disturbing to me exactly how much these segments don't actually resemble Fear Factor, but rather college hazing. <laughs> They literally have men in sunglasses dragging the children to each challenge, and in some of those segments, in fact most of them, the children look very visibly uncomfortable, like they don't want to be there. Brian Haynes even says in his segment, on his dare, Brian, I don't like this. <laughs> I feel all gross, and, and I'm covered with peanut butter. Yes, they were kids, and yes, their parents signed off, but I can't help but feel like these dares weren't done with the intent to entertain. They're done with the intent to humiliate. And judging by the fact that many of these now adults are saying that they wish they could have said no to them as a child, I would say the humiliation worked. For an entire generation of children, we watched as these kids were humiliated, and it was normalized. Something that was brought up by the two female writers of The Amanda Show was that Dan would repeatedly ask them to describe their ideas like they were having <clears throat> adult relations during the presentation of skits that were being written for a high school girl. That's not creepy and not inappropriate at all. As if that weren't enough, there was also alleged instances of him showing people inappropriate pictures on his computer. Rhymes with corn, and it's not the kind that they got down in Idaho. Okay, that's the potato state. Either way, neither Idaho nor cornography are safe in the workplace. This is pure by the book sexual harassment, and honestly, it gets worse when it's brought to set. So let me state no, Dan Schneider has not been accused at this present moment of showing any sort of pornography to children. However, he has been accused of putting children in scenes that resemble pornography as part of children's jokes on these shows. And honestly, I can't disagree with that statement. There are a lot of situations on this show that involve white or clear liquid being squirted on these kids' faces and just in, out. Uh -huh. So much feet! To the point where actress Alexa Nichols stated that Dan Schneider would take pictures of the young cast members' feet when trying on costumes. Why? Why so much feet? Like, way too much feet! Dan has repeatedly stated that none of these jokes were intended to be sexual, but given the amount of sexual innuendos that were happening, allegedly, in the writer's room, and allegedly, according to one of the writers, he purposefully named the character Penelope Taint, thinking it was funny to name the character after an inappropriate male body part. As if that weren't enough, Dan said in previous interviews back in 2013 that he snuck in adult jokes for the parents to enjoy. Listen. For me, and maybe this is just my personal opinion, there are way too many instances where the innuendo is too much. I get that the early 2000s was a different time for humor, but bare minimum, this was sexual harassment of minors on set. And in doing research for this video, I even found pictures that have now resurfaced of some of the underage actors sitting on Dan's lap. For one, you should never, ever, as a boss, have your employee sitting on your lap. That goes double, triple, quadruple, quintuple. If your employee is a literal child, disgusting, inexcusable. And if that weren't enough, 
one that has also resurfaced and not been addressed and repeatedly tweeted pictures of his underage actor's feet. Listen, I am already not a person who thinks that children should be posted online in general. Children aren't content, period. And given I am also someone very familiar with the spicy content world, I know what those pictures are used for by the people who consume them. And being honest, I can't imagine that Dan, as an adult, didn't know how those kinds of pictures would be used either. Dan has repeatedly denied most of these allegations throughout the years, stating that they're just misconstrued or misunderstood. But there's no misunderstanding the amount of pain that these kids are still continuing to go through to this day. Whether it was misunderstood or not, it's causing them trauma. And that trauma should not be minimized. But unfortunately, for the most traumatized involved, it has been very, very minimized. Okay, now here's the part of the video where I'm going to have to ask people to put on their nuance caps and remember something very important, okay? Two things can be true at once. During his time on set at The Amanda Show and shortly before his time filming Drake and Josh, Drake was a blossoming child actor working on commercials, guest spots on TV shows, and trying to start a career in the music industry. During this time, he was also receiving acting and career coaching from the on-set dialect coach for The Amanda Show, a man named Brian Peck. All right, that rips it. I am reporting your name to the manager. The manager already knows my name. According to Drake Bell, Brian Peck had inserted himself into his life, his career, and driving a wedge between Bell and his father. These are two really common abuse tactics known as grooming and isolation. The grooming is done when the abusive person is inserting themselves into the victim's life, love bombing them, getting them gifts, making the victim reliant on them in any way possible. In the case of Brian, he would pay special attention to Drake, drive two hours out of town in order to see Drake perform at his concert, and take Drake on trips to Disney. The next step is isolating the victim from anyone that can prevent or stop the abuse. This was done by Brian telling Drake that his father should not be trusted, that his father was stealing his money, and that no one liked having Drake's father on set. Once Drake's father had been pushed out of the picture, Drake was now living with his mother, and Brian would then tell Drake's mother that it would only make sense for Drake to stay the night at Brian's home during the time when Drake would have auditions to attend, which Drake's mother agreed to. It was at that point when the assault began. Hi everyone, this is post-production Ricky here. Since making this video, I'm seeing a lot of people be angry and aggressive towards Drake's mother, calling her a second villain because she didn't want to drive her son to auditions. And again, I'm gonna ask people to put on their nuance caps here. Please remember that when a grooming is done against a child, they are not just grooming the child, they also groom the parents so that they can continue to have access to that child. This woman was now a single mother according to the child separation agreement and she had other children that she also had to maintain responsibility for so she was managing multiple children and now an acting career that she was not trained to do so it's very possible that brian could have come into their lives and said hey well i know everything about this business because i've been in this business for so long and i'm connected to all of these people why don't I just help you out with this? Why don't I take Drake to, to his auditions and everything? Because I know these casting directors. They, they see me and they'll, it'll give him a leg up in the industry. That's something that we're not considering that could have happened. Now, I don't know that this happened because I wasn't there and her voice has not been heard in the documentary. But these are some examples that I have seen when working with parents of children who have been assaulted. This is very often the kinds of excuses that they give these parents to gain access to these children. And also please remember the early 2000s and 90s was an entirely different time. People are more aware now of childhood sexual abuse than they were back then. This was before the spotlight journalism that happened to highlight all of the CSA that was happening within the Catholic Church that really brought CSA to the mainstream as a discussion. This kind of stuff wasn't on people's minds back then. We didn't have the same access to social media. We didn't have the same access to the news. Please give this woman just a little bit of grace. 
In 2003, at the young age of only 17, after being confronted by his girlfriend's mother, Drake finally broke down and told a therapist, and later his own mother, what was happening between him and Brian. He went on to press charges, and in 2004, Brian pled no contest to two of the 11 charges of essay brought against him. During this time, 41 people wrote letters of support to Brian to the judge, asking that Brian's charges, which again, he pled no contest to, meaning that in this case, he legally admitted to doing it, 41 people wrote letters asking that his charges be reduced. And they were. He received only 16 months of jail for essaying a minor, a child. Of the 41 people who were asking for Brian to receive less time, less than a year and a half for acts that I can't even describe, some notable names that were listed include Will Freddle from Boy Meets World and Kim Possible, Alan Thicke, and James Marsden. As someone whose absolute favorite Disney movie is Enchanted, that one hurt so bad. I've been dreaming of a true love's kiss and a prince who doesn't support pieces of shit. Now with all of that said, this is one of the parts of the story where I need people to put on those nuance caps to remind everyone something extremely important. 2004 was a very different time than right now. We can be angry and upset at Mila Kunis and Ashton Kutcher for writing letters of support of Danny Masterson in 2023 because there have been years of the internet being a thing and they knew the effects that writing such letters would have on victims. This is an entirely different situation. There's a lot of nuance involved. 2004 was not a great time to be gay in the industry and Brian Peck certainly weaponized it with a lot of them, saying that they were only accusing him of this because he was gay. Even though he literally pled no contest, he admitted to doing it. And on top of that, many of the people who did write letters, including both Marsden and Friddle, met Brian Peck when they themselves were children. It's important to remember that abusers often groom more than one victim, even if they don't ever actually harm both. Not all grooming is for SUO purpose, and in fact, he very possibly could have been grooming them so that he could use them as character vouchers if one of his other victims ever came forward. This is not an uncommon thing, and it does happen frequently. Friedel even spoke out on his podcast stating, there's an actual victim here, and he turned us against the victim to where we're now on his team. That's the thing where, to me, I look back at that as my ever-loving shame for this entire thing. Getting taken in by somebody who's a good actor and a good manipulator, I could chalk that up to being young and that's the way it is. It's awful. I'm going to use that for my growth as a human being, but when there's an actual victim involved and now I'm on the abuser's side, that's the thing I can't get over and haven't been able to get over. Given that I am not Drake Bell and therefore it's not my apology to accept, my opinion doesn't matter much here. But I do appreciate that he doesn't shy away from his actions and his impact in the situation. Unlike some other people. <laughs> Daniel, we told you never to speak about that. Get back in your hole, Daniel, and give me your holes. That, dear friends, is none other than the star of Ned's Declassified School Survival Guide, making a joke to his co-stars of the same show about Drake Bell's assault. I think Drake himself summed it up pretty well by calling them Ned's declassless, because how classless do you actually have to be to make jokes about sexual assault like that? And as for Devin's apology, asked to comment on the Quiet On Set documentary, which we hadn't seen. But you did see it. You, you commented on it in the video. Our set was not like that. Um, uh, and no, it's fucking well, the, the, the Drake Bell shit, the, like, that's crazy to hear. I, I looked like I was talking about Drake. Because you were talking about him. You you even said his name in the video. The, the Drake Bell shit, the, like, that's crazy to hear. I, I... Um, we hadn't seen the doc. Then how did you know your set wasn't like that? And... How did you know about the Drake Bell stuff if you hadn't seen the doc? No, but I, I, we fucked up. Yeah, like, absolutely. I get, I get what it looks, looks like. like. It looks like you're making fun of an SA victim, which you are, and you were aware of it. You even said in the video. <laughs> Sorry, we shouldn't joke about this. We really shouldn't. The Drake Bell shit, is a, like that's crazy to hear. I, I, that is. Yeah.
Man. Can't joke like this, Jesus. Guys, we're, 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 sometimes humor helps us move through things, yeah. you know? Saying you're gutted that you hurt someone and that you're sorry for compounding the hurt, why not just say what you actually did? I'm sorry for making fun of an essay survivor. This here is one of many reasons why male survivors struggle to come forward. Very often within media, if a man was assaulted, especially in the way that Drake was, it's treated as a joke. It's such a common joke that it's in shows like Powerpuff Girls or even Broad City, where they say things like reverse rapism as a joke. It's not funny. It's never been funny. It will never be funny. Male survivors deserve all the respect that we can give them. Point blank period. Now, with all of that said, I once again need to ask people to put on their nuance caps here because there's something else we need to talk about. Drake Bell himself was also accused of grooming a minor. Back in 2017, Drake Bell allegedly sent inappropriate text messages to a minor. The victim alleges that the messages started when she was only 12 years old and at the age of 15 became explicitly sexual in nature. Drake Bell pled guilty to the charges of attempted child endangerment in 2021 with the judge stating, Your position and celebrity status enabled you to nurture this relationship. You were able to gain access to this child and you were able to gain the trust of the child. So, it's a two-edged sword, your position. I hope you truly are remorseful. Now, since we all have our nuance caps on, let's remember, two things can be true at once. Drake Bell can be both a victim and a perpetrator at the same time in two different scenarios. His actions as an adult do not justify the horrors he went through as a child nor does it justify the jokes and the inappropriate commentary on it now. And at the same time, Drake Bell's childhood trauma does not excuse his actions as an adult that turned another child into a victim. Unfortunately, this is common for abuse victims, especially those who were abused in childhood. Studies show that unfortunately one third of abuse victims perpetuate that abuse on someone else in their lifetime. Drake happened to be one of those people. I hope that everyone in this situation gets the help and support that they need so that the cycle of abuse stops here and now. I hope that there are no more children impacted by the actions of adults who should have known better. When it comes to Drake Bell's situation, he has stated that out of the adults in his life, the only person who was there for him throughout his situation was Dan Schneider. Likely because Dan was one of the few people who actually knew what was happening. But once again, two things can be true at once. Dan was there for Drake when Drake needed someone, and he caused harm, severe harm to others. Harm that some still struggle to speak about to this day without fear of consequences. Amanda Bynes was a person who was once one of the most famous child actors in America, reaching levels of stardom previously known by actors such as Macaulay Culkin, Lindsay Lohan, and even Britney Spears. And, like all of them, Amanda Bynes had her own series of very severe public meltdowns, which really began when she was 16, where she attempted to run away from home. At the time, Amanda was dating Taron Killam, who is sus not only because he was a 19-year-old dating a 15-year-old, but also around that time, he was one of the people who wrote a letter in support of Brian Peck during his sentencing for crimes against Drake Bell. This romantic pattern is unfortunately the beginning of a very, very sad one where Amanda continued to surround herself with older men. She dated Nick Zano when she was 17 and he was 24. And then when she was 22, she dated a then 35 year old Seth MacFarlane. <coughs> to me, this kind of pattern indicates that this behavior was seen as normal for her. And that's a very sad thing. When Amanda was 16, she made an attempt to run away from home, calling the one person who had made himself the most important part of her life at the time, creator of her show and her boss, Dan Schneider. She called him roughly around one or two in the morning after getting into a fight with her parents, allegedly specifically her father. Dan calls someone who's close who could pick her up and Amanda wound up being taken to the police station. She then made an attempt to file for legal emancipation from her parents, a request that she was denied. 
She wound up continuing to have an acting career, but notably mentioning later in life that after this, her mental health began to go into a severe decline, despite continuing to work project after project after project until announcing her retirement in 2010 after filming Easy A. At this point, Amanda Bynes became like a social enigma. But unlike previous decades where celebrity meltdowns were only documented when they went out in public, like Lindsay Lohan or Britney Spears before her, Amanda Bynes now had access to something that really put an even bigger magnifying glass onto her mental health decline, social media. Throughout 2013, Amanda Bynes released a series of rather disturbing tweets. No, I will not be calling them exes. Elon, if you can dead name your daughter, I can dead name your website. Amanda Bynes released a series of disturbing tweets that were honestly weird and in many cases racist. Tweets where she stated a list of people in her life previously who she thought was ugly, including Rihanna, Zac Efron, Chrissy Teigen, Barack and Michelle Obama. And the only person who seemed to be safe from these ugly accusations was Liam Hemsworth. That's what he Listen, a girl loves a himbo. She also started getting a series of plastic surgeries done, including a nose job, which she attested to at the time, correcting a birth defect that she'd lived with her entire life. She announced that this was going to be the first in a very long line of plastic surgery. All of this was a very public psychotic episode that unfortunately, like many before her, landed her into a conservatorship. For those who are unfamiliar with movements like the hashtag Free Britney movement who might not know what a conservatorship is, a conservatorship is defined as when a person is not legally found able to be responsible for their own medical or monetary financial decisions. During her conservatorship, Amanda Bynes' mother, Lynn Bynes, was placed as her conservator, taking full control of Amanda's financial and medical decisions. And for a while, Amanda Bynes was quiet to the world and on social media. But unfortunately, as often happens, in 2014, she started tweeting again, this time tweeting some very serious allegations of SA against her father, Rick Bynes. These allegations have been deflected by Lynn, stating that Rick is a wonderful husband and father and that Amanda was suffering another mental health crisis, after which Amanda once again went quiet online. Then things got a little weird. In the year 2016, another account seems to have surfaced, Persian LA 27, going by the name Ashley Banks popped up, which it's either Amanda Bynes herself or at least somebody pretending to be Amanda Bynes. In now deleted tweets, the account did specifically state that it was secretly Amanda Bynes posting on it due to the conservatorship her parents had taken control of her actual Twitter account, so she needed to post what was happening there. The account then continued to share more accusations of sexual assault against her father, and then one tweet that has now resurfaced since the release of the other accusations against Dan Schneider. Can you imagine having an abortion at 13 because your boss impregnated you? Now, here's something extremely important to remember. It's important that we believe victims first, always. But with that said, this particular accusation has never been officially stated by Amanda Bynes herself. Yes, this account looks like it could be legitimate, with the half picture posted of Amanda Bynes' driver's license, but there are also some things that do cause me to be a little suspicious of the legitimacy of this account. The main one being the fact that there is a cash app listed in the bio, and anyone who has attempted to send money to said cash app must sign a non-disclosure agreement first, and then they are allegedly blocked afterwards. I cannot say definitively that this account is or isn't actually Amanda Bynes, but what I can say is be careful of who you send money to online. The thing is, we will not know fully what happened with Amanda Bynes on the set of All That and The Amanda Show, and we may never know. And that's okay. It's up to Amanda to decide that she is ready to come forward with her story, something that she doesn't seem to want to do anytime soon. In fact, as of right now, she has just about left the internet, canceling her podcast in order to go get her cosmetology license to get a job as a manicurist, something that I think is absolutely amazing. And the amount of harassment that she is currently receiving from people who care about her is really sad. Amanda did not consent to being part of the documentary Quiet On Set. 
and she has her own reasons for doing so that are none of our business. I debated heavily whether or not to include this part of the story in the video, mostly because, again, I don't think Amanda is currently ready to tell her story. If she were ready to, she likely would share it. But she hasn't, and she's not, and no one should be pressuring her to do so. The reason I decided to include this in the video in the end was to let everybody know of what I had discovered in my research for the video. Because, and I don't think people realize this, all this speculation that's been done can cause some real emotional damage to Amanda herself. No matter what, she was a child. And she was a child who was robbed of her childhood for our entertainment. We don't need to add other traumas on top of what she already has. And those are just the ones that we absolutely know for certain. The best way to support this girl is to just leave her the shark alone. There are other stories that have been willingly shared that can be discussed in the story of Dan Schneider and the many abuses of being a child star on the set for Nickelodeon Studios. Jeanette McCurdy and Alexa Nichols can honestly be the two people credited most with bringing these stories to the public eye. In her best-selling memoir, I Am Glad My Mom Died, Jeanette McCurdy has opened up about the treatment that she received at the hands of the creator during her time filming on both iCarly and Sam and Cat. The creator is never mentioned by name, but it has been alleged to be Dan Schneider himself something that Dan Schneider seems to agree with in his apology. We'll get to that later. God, I know this video is a long one, but there is just so much to talk about with this story and so much to unpack here, but I promise we're getting there. Some of the most damning accusations against the creator in the book are that he would offer underage actors alcohol on set, trying to pitch the shows against each other, saying things like... Come on, take a sip. No thanks. Come on. I've never had alcohol before, and I'm only 18. Couldn't I get in trouble? No one's looking, Jeanette. You're fine. I don't know. Victoria's kids get drunk together all the time. iCarly kids are so wholesome. We need to give you guys a little edge. This actually lines up with what actor Avon Jogia has stated during his time as back on Victorious, where he's repeatedly made videos saying that he was actually drunk or hungover during most of filming. The fact that this was known and encouraged is absolutely disgusting. And for the creator to try and encourage other underage actors to do it as a means of loosening them up is just so gross. And in Jeanette's book, she also corroborates Alexa Nichols' previous claims about the costumes being overly sexualized with Nickelodeon and having the creator heavily involved in approving the outfits. I asked if I could please just try on one pieces with board shorts, the way that I feel most comfortable in a bathing suit, being covered up. But our wardrobe designer said that the creator explicitly asked for bikinis, and so she had to have me try on one or two of them so he had the option. She also describes how things got so terrible with the creator's behavior that he was banned from work for a hostile work environment. The creator has gotten in trouble from the network for accusations of his emotional abuse. I feel like it's been a long time coming, and should have happened a lot sooner. I appreciate the amount of trouble he's gotten in. It wasn't just a slap on the wrist sort of thing. It's to the point where he's no longer allowed to be on set with any actors, which makes communication in between takes complicated. This resulted in the show being cancelled shortly after, with Jeanette being offered $300,000 worth of settlement, which she called hush money, in order to not talk about her experiences on set. Something that she did not take. Something that I think other survivors of Dan's behavior and abuse are thankful for, because, in all honesty, Jeanette's book last year, I'm Glad My Mom Died, really forced a lot of the abuses faced by child stars and especially those who are on Nickelodeon, into the limelight. So much so that this documentary was made. And Dan Schneider was forced to respond. Last week, in response to the accusations brought to light by the documentary Quiet on Set, Dan Schneider sat down for an absolutely fair and totally unbiased interview done by... Hey, it's Boogie. Boogie. 
the actor who played Tebow on iCarly. Who cares? <laughs> this is why we don't trust a man who can put a taco on a stick. It's impossible. <laughs> Boogie sat down to give Dan some questions about what we saw in the documentary. Some things Dan absolutely denied, like the accusation that he had been banned from set. Never, never, never happened. And he was actually just trying to cancel the show and get rid of it. And what they don't know, maybe, is I did everything I could to make that show go away. My producer partner at the time, we would call and say, this is a not a good situation. As if that makes it any better. And as for the accusations of sexualizing children in situations, Dan downplayed it as just jokes being written for a kid audience. There's no adult intent. But Dan, you know what else has kid jokes written for a kid audience? Spongebob? Danny Phantom? Fairly odd parents, though of course that one's creator has his own list of problems which I don't really want to go into now. But that's not reflected in the product. None of these shows have been accused of putting children in sexualizing situations or normalizing sexual jokes for kids. In my personal opinion, Dan, that is an excuse bordering on a fucking lie. Especially given the amount of people coming forward stating that you told them not to tell the network what specific words and phrases meant. You knew what you were doing. It doesn't matter if the kids didn't. You wrote and recorded Ariana Grande sitting on a bed pouring water on herself saying, I'm soaking wet. You knew. You did it on purpose. Allegedly. Dan also had a very interesting response in the interview when the topic of the on-air dares was brought up. I think that some of the on-air dares went too far. I think they pushed the envelope too far. Not all of them, not most of them, but some did. Uh, some? Some? And, and most of them were okay? Okay, um, here's a list of some of the dares that were apparently okay on this show. A child being pecked by chickens. A child being used as a punching bag. A child being drenched in a rotten squid. A child being drenched in rotten fish. A child drinking an entire gallon of sweat. Which of the dares were okay, Dan? Which of them were okay? Because that's most of them. That's not some, that's most. Most of them, but some did. Nickelodeon wanted to do their version of Fear Factor. It's hard to do because we don't have the budget of Fear Factor. Sure. So you emotionally traumatize these children and humiliate them because you don't have the budget of Fear Factor? What? How is this an excuse? Dan also stated that he had no say in people's salaries during his time as showrunner on The Amanda Show. I have nothing to do with paying writers. I never have. I've never made a writer's deal. And of all the writers I've been in a writer's room with, I never even knew how much most of them were getting paid. Sure, you don't get to make money up on the spot for a studio to spend. But the idea that it was all completely above board for the only two female writers on The Amanda Show to split a single salary sounds real sus to me given that the second Jenny reported it to the Writers Guild of America suddenly they didn't have to share a salary anymore. It's real sus to me Dan. Don't be suspicious don't be suspicious oh, don't be suspicious don't be suspicious. Both Dan and Boogie diminished the claims of racism that was made by actors Brian Hayes along with Angelique Lee with Boogie then bringing up I saw you be honored for diversity in your work. Yes, and every show I did after that had a lead black actor in it. I don't know what other white person needs to hear this, but hiring black people, being around black people, being friends with black people, being family with black people, does not mean that you are not responsible for any sort of racist actions that you caused against them. You can have black friends, black employees, black family members, and still be racist. The racism that Brian and the other members of the cast faced was real. And it didn't matter if it wasn't Dan himself who said it or did the racist things. He, as the head of the show, fostered an environment in which people felt safe enough to be racist to these poor children. It was his responsibility to fix it. Boogie may not have experienced it himself, 
But that doesn't mean that Brian and Angelique's experiences don't matter. Do you remember that time when Colleen Ballinger responded to accusations of grooming with a ukulele? This non-apology felt like the non-musical version of that. Every one of those jokes was written for a kid audience because kids thought they were funny. I'm not a groomer. I'm just a loser. Nothing but minimization and deflection of responsibility. Dan Schneider, they deserved better. I always thought of myself more as a Disney child growing up, loving shows like That's So Raven, Sister Sister, and Hannah Montana. But... I can't deny that shows like All That, The Amanda Show, Drake and Josh, and iCarly helped shape definitive portions of my childhood. One of my auditory stims for much of my life has been the meh <laughs> sound from The Amanda Show. I was even inspired to be a content creator after watching iCarly. And it absolutely breaks my heart that my childhood was made at the sacrifice of so many other children. But that begs the question, who do we hold responsible for the robbing of these kids' childhood? I see a lot of people saying that Nickelodeon should be held responsible for this, and while, yes, I agree, it's important that we don't stop there, though. Though it hasn't been mentioned very much, Disney actually went on to hire Brian Peck as a voice actor for The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody after he had already been convicted and forced to register as an S offender. And on top of that, former child star Allison Stoner has talked about the many abuses she faced working primarily for Disney Channel in the early 2000s. And former child actress and friend of mine, Erin Elaine Doyle, has gone on record telling her story of the racism that she faced during her time on set filming Disney's Camp Rock. It seems like you're making a very casual insinuation to an orgasm. And it could be because you have so conveniently placed me um, as a woman dancing on a table. Because basically what they did is they created my character to be the modern day children's version of the Jezebel archetype from Jim Crow era. This is not a singularly Nickelodeon or Dan Schneider problem although this may be one of the biggest ones that we've ever seen happen in plain sight. This is a problem with the entertainment industry and their treatment of child actors as a whole. The ways in which child labor laws and sag after don't protect child actors enough. I'm not gonna pretend like I have all the answers or solutions, but I will state that something has to change. This cannot happen again. We cannot let it happen again. Enough is enough. No more Amandas, no more Drakes, no more Jeanettes. Child actors deserve to have a safe space where they can perform and not be abused by people targeting the vulnerable. They deserve to be protected. They all do. If you have made it to the end of the video, thank you so much for watching and welcome to our Patreon shout out. This is where we shout out members of our Patreon. Today's shout out goes to Jared, who has been a member of our Patreon for three months now. Um, you should finally be getting that merch. Let me know if you get it. We are so happy to have you on our Patreon. And if you would like to be uh, the next member of the Patreon shout out, be sure to take a look at our Patreon linked down below. All of the proceeds go to making these videos. They take a lot of time, a lot of effort, and mac and cheese. I need the mac and cheese. Thank you all so much for watching. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, and I will see you in the next video.